Hello and welcome to this lecture on teams. Most of us have been or currently are on a number of teams. We might be on a team in a sports league or on a team in charge of providing food and beverages for the next neighborhood get together or a member of say an accounting team or a quality control team at work. Most teams have several things in common and we'll learn about those things in this lecture. So let's get started. First, we have to realize that there are a variety of different types of teams, especially in the workplace. First, we have what are called departmental teams. These are simply teams because of their co-location, that is their distance from each other. They have very minimal interdependence. For example, back in the 1940s and 50s, when the workplace was basically a male dominated enterprise, there would be what they call typing pools of female secretaries. And this would be a large number of women who typed up documents, took dictation, took notes, wrote memos, etc., for the male executives. Well, in those days, the uh, females were relegated to an inferior role in the organization. Thank heaven those times have changed. But the typing pool didn't have a particular secretary, now referred to as an administrative assistant, assigned to any one particular executive. The executive walked out and said, who can type this up? And somebody would raise their hand and say, I'm free, I'll do it. They were all a member of a team, but essentially not much of a real team because of their lack of interdependence, that is, the lack of the reliance upon each other for the performance of different related duties. Next, we have what are called production or service or sometimes even leadership teams. These are multi-skilled teams that have a collective production in mind. For example, on an assembly line, we have production teams. And these are groups of people who work interdependently toward each other who are responsible for the final output, for the final product. We have leadership teams many times organizations forego a single person CEO and they have an office of the CEO or maybe there are co-CEOs and these are teams of leaders sometimes referred to as top management teams or TMT uh, that make decisions collectively so no one single person is responsible for the decision it's uh, implemented as as part of a an interdependent team then we have self-directed teams. These have perhaps the highest interdependence and the most autonomy of all teams. A self-directed team is a team that hires and fires its own members, decides what projects to work on, decides how to allocate time and financial resources and equipment, etc., to the team's project. So they really don't have a manager. They really report to hardly anyone and they're responsible for conducting the job completely at their own discretion. The manufacturer W.L. Gore makes use of these, but this is really difficult to implement. Uh, it's best implemented when you have a team of ex highly experienced, very professional employees. We wouldn't let newbies or entry-level workers uh, engage in self-directed teamwork because they perhaps don't have the skills and the abilities to perform well in that sort of a, a setting. Uh, next, we have advisory teams. These are teams that simply provide recommendations or advice to others in the organization. So they really have no authority, but they can advise on what to do. They can try and enforce it. They can press hard. Um, and in the era of total quality management, this gave rise to something called quality circles. And a quality circle is a team of people who look at all the processes and all of the uh, workplace procedures, etc., and come up with ways to improve the quality of the workplace or the project or the product or the service or whatever. And so their job is to make advice and to uh, hopefully try and get that implemented. For those of us who may live in a neighborhood that has a homeowners association, the HOA does have enforcement abilities, but uh, often they will farm out certain uh, of their duties. For example, some HOAs, 
homeowners associations have a uh, an architecture committee, which uh, recommends to the HOA whether or not someone's change to the outside appearance of their home is acceptable or not. So they'll review the colors and if you're gonna if you can replace the columns in front and you know do you can they can you change the roof line, et cetera, and they'll make the recommendation to the HOA. So in that capacity, an architectural committee is an advisory team to a homeowners association. We also have task force teams. These are project teams. They're engaged in temporary problem solving. For example, when an automobile company wants to come up with a new automobile line, a new product in essence, they'll put together a cross-functional task force team of designers and engineers and finance people and production people and marketing people. And they'll put them all on this team to come up with a new car model. And then once the model has been designed, implemented, etc., the team disbands and the task force goes away. Many times companies will create an ad hoc task force team to address a particular problem in the workplace. Maybe it's too much employee uh, turnover. Maybe it's um, uh, problems with the performance appraisal system. And so they go in and solve the problem, fix the problem, and then go back to what it is they were doing before that. We also have virtual teams. These teams are increasingly common in the 24-7 interconnected, internet-connected world that we live in. These teams operate across space, time, and sometimes even organizational boundaries. Um, for example, consulting firms like Deloitte will place its employees actually inside of companies like Hewlett Packard. And so they work virtually with their coworkers back at Deloitte, but they also work virtually with HP employees from around the world. Many times, if we have coworkers who work in different parts of the world, we may be working together on a project, but never even have face-to-face -face communication. We may use instant messaging or email or video conferencing or things like that to kind of facilitate the communication that's really required within that of a team. Next, we have communities of practice. These are very informal teams. They're really not much of a team, so to speak, but they're bound by a mutual interest. For example, some of us may be on email list serves associated with a, a particular interest that we have. There are list serves for uh, Bayesian statistics experts. There are list serves for structural equation modeling, for psychologists, for all sorts of different special interests. And these people rarely probably see each other face to face, uh, but they're essentially part of the same team in that one person can go on the list serve, pose a question, explain a situation, and others from around the world will chime in with perhaps a, a decent solution for them. So these communities of practice are a type of team. Last but certainly not least on this list is Skunk Works teams. Skunk Works teams are multi-skilled teams, usually located far away from others in the company, almost always free from bureaucratic hierarchy, and they tend to act as innovation or product champions. So Apple computers made great use of these teams. What they did was when they developed the iPod, no one at Apple except the Skunk Works team and the top executives like Steve Jobs and others were aware that an iPod was even in the works, so to speak. This team worked far away in secrecy to develop this new product and then spring it on the world. When Steve Jobs introduced the iPod back in 2001, there were uh, thousands of Apple employees who were completely unaware that this new product was coming out. They were as unaware as was the average consumer. So Skunk Works Teams gets its name from being far away from others, much like if you had, say, a pet skunk, you wouldn't keep him in the house. You'd keep him far away from the house unless you know he let out his uh, 
aroma. <laughs> so Skunk Works teams are uh, multi-skilled and located far away from others and free from bureaucratic hierarchy. Well, let's move on. There are a host of different challenges that teams can face. Sometimes individuals simply perform better or faster on the task if left to do it alone. Some companies and organizations put people in teams because they think teamwork is the panacea that cures all that ails the modern organization. Some universities, most probably, have faculty senates. And in the faculty senate, there are a host of committees. Many faculty senates also have a committee for committees. So if you can believe that, the committee for committees decide who's, decides who's going to be on the other committees. Um, sometimes we have teams for teams' sake alone, and that's perhaps not always best. There are often associated with teams what are called process losses, sometimes referred to as coordination cost. And process losses or coordination costs are simply the cost of developing and maintaining a team. Sometimes you spend more time trying to coordinate the schedule of a team than you do actually working on the project. If you're in a course that has teamwork, as most graduate level courses do, they have team projects, Think for a second about the average size of your team. It's probably in the three to five or the four to six person range. What if you were put on a team that had 20 people? Let's say there were 40 people in the class and there are only two teams. You would spend an inordinate amount of time trying to make sure that all 20 members of your team could get on the same page, so to speak. You would have tremendous coordination costs associated with that team. So the size of the team really matters. The distance between the teammates really matters. And all these things add up to process losses. Now, some companies simply don't support the best work environment for team dynamics. Teams need appropriate rewards, appropriate communication systems, and they need effective team leadership in most instances. If a company pays people solely upon individual performance and they're placed in a team, you may have some members of the team jockeying for uh, notoriety. They may be willing to stick their head up and say, I did this, I did this, I did this, and my team didn't do anything. Hey, boss, give me the reward because these guys you saddled me with are slackers. Well, if we put people in teams, we need to reward them based upon team performance. So supposedly, the two heads are better than one adage works. If two heads are better than one, then two heads will perform better than one. If a team performs well, then the team should share in the rewards. Also, we need to make sure that there are effective communication systems in place. In a virtual team that communicates, let's say, ridiculously, by fax machine only, that's going to really slow things down. The organization's environment doesn't foster effective communication if all you use is a fax machine. You have to set up some video conferencing or at least some instant messaging or something that's in near live time so you can have fully synchronous communication. And then, of course, in teams, if there is an assigned leader, or if someone simply rises up to the position of leader in the team, that person needs to have effective training and experience to guide the team in the right direction. Team, organizations that put people into teams and say, well, all right, we're sure one of you can figure this out, are probably setting up their teams to fail. Next, we have something called Brooks Law. And Brooks Law is simply adding team members in a time of crisis so that it actually slows down the team rather than speeding it up. Think, for example, about a team with a tight deadline on a major project, and it looks like as the deadline approaches ever near, they simply aren't going to meet it. 
what do they do? They go out and add 10 more people to their team of 10, 10 members now. Now they've doubled the size of their team. Adding these people to the team increases the coordination cost. Now you have to get these new members of the team up to speed on what's going on. They simply spend all of their time figuring out what they're supposed to be doing and why they're in the position they are, and the team effectively never finishes the project. So sometimes just adding people to a team slows it down rather than speeding it up, and that's called Brooks' Law. Last but certainly not least on this list, we have the ever-dreaded concept of social loafing. Some team members simply do not contribute their fair share. They cause other people to do more work. If there are particularly conscientious members of a team that want to perform well on the project and there's a slacker on the team and the slacker doesn't do what it is they were assigned to do, the conscientious members of the team have to pick up their slack. And that's a shame. It's a real shame that some people have to work harder than others in the team in order for the team to perform at a reasonable level. This is an ever-present problem in team projects at the university. Many people are put into teams in projects for their classwork, and there's always one person who claims they've simply got too much stuff going on to effectively be a part of the team. However, they often equally share in the team grade. Well, the team grade would have been artificially depressed if their slacking had not been picked up by the more conscientious members of the group. So if everyone falls down on the job, so to speak, the team performs poorly, but some members of the team are not going to allow that. And that's why social loafing is such a despised part of teamwork. Well, let's move on. Okay, let's explore this model of team effectiveness. These are the antecedent conditions or characteristics of the workplace which promote effective team work. So on the far left-hand side, what we see are organizational and team environment aspects. So of course, it's best to have at least some team-based rewards as previously discussed. It's also important that you organize team around work processes. This will increase the inter-team communication. Think, for example, about an assembly line team that shepherds a product all the way down the assembly line rather than passing the product off from one person to another person to another person with whom they have very little communication. If a team of four to six workers at an assembly line walk with the product and are responsible for completing the product from the very beginning stages to the complete end product, they're going to be required to communicate effectively with each, with each other. Now, of course, we also hope that there are workspaces that in, encourage collaboration. So if everyone's in a private office with a closed door, there's not going to be as much collaboration as if everyone is in, say, the, the bullpen setup. The bullpen setup is when everyone is in a cubicle-free group area working on teams right next uh, working on projects right next to each other and so there would be lots of collaboration and communication and maybe just a little bit of noise of course we should also have the, the appropriate organizational structure in place and that means that we have to have some hierarchical reporting relationship such that members of a team know to whom they report unless you're a self-directed work team, and that these sorts of teams are recognized as an integral part of the organizational structure. And then last but certainly not least, we have to have organizational leadership that uh, is supports and uh, makes a strategic orientation towards the implementation of teamwork in the workplace. If the leader does not believe in teamwork, then the people on the teams will not believe in what they are doing as a member of the team. So this is a very top-down, very important sort of a thing. So going then from the far left-hand side to the box in the middle called team design, what we're saying is that these organizational and team environmental aspects cause, lead to, or are strongly associated with aspects of the team design. 
So we have task characteristics in the top of that box there. This is the degree of interdependence that the teams have. And we'll talk more about that on a subsequent uh, a slide. Next, we have team size. The team should be large enough to get the job done, but small enough to minimize coordination cost or process losses. Very large teams should be broken into manageable chunks, which promote and allow for effective interpersonal communication. And then we have team composition. This is associated with diversity characteristics, finding a balance which allows for a broad range of competencies leading to faster and better decision making while fostering strong interpersonal relations is the goal. These interpersonal relations tend to lead to stronger cooperation between the teammates. So often we'll use cross-functional teams and in this regard, the diversity characteristics are what part of the company are you from? So we would have an accountant and someone from finance and someone from human resources and someone from production, etc. And that would be a very diverse team and they would have perhaps a variety of different views on how this should be done. So picking how the team is composed is an incredibly important part of later predicting team effectiveness. Now in the box in the middle there on the bottom, we have team processes. Well, these are really important things that go on within the team. So we have these stages of team development, which we'll look at in greater detail on a subsequent slide. We have team norms. These are the rules that the team develops for their own selves on what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior within the team. And this is an important part of pushing the team forward, making it successful. We have team trust, and we'll talk about levels of trust on a subsequent slide. And then we have team cohesiveness, and that's the degree to which people want to become and remain a member of the team. It's the glue that bonds them together. And we'll talk about that in greater detail as well on a subsequent slide. But let's look at the three ways that we can actually measure team effectiveness. That is, is our team doing a good job? Well, one way of measuring that is from their performance. We put people in teams so they can perform a job. If we can measure individual performance, surely we can measure team performance. Maybe it's team-based sales and we look at the dollar value of the sales that the team is able to get for the company. Maybe it's uh, team-based quality issues. The uh, Can the team effectively minimize the number of errors in the product or the service that it provides? So these are clear-cut aspects of team effectiveness, team performance. We also can measure how well a team, how effective a team is working by looking at their satisfaction. That is, are the members of the team satisfied? Do they have a sense of well-being because of being a member of the team? If each member of the team simply despises each other, they're not going to be working very effectively. This may seem like a rather tangential approach to measuring team effectiveness, but team member satisfaction is really important. If people aren't happy on the team, they're unlikely to perform well in the team. And last but certainly not least on this list, we have survival. That is team survival. That is how long does the team exist? If in our workplace, people are members of a team and they ultimately find that they don't work well with the other members of the team and so the team disbands and those members are placed on new teams, the fact that the, that the team failed to survive, that is failed to live a long life, so to speak, as members of a team, means that the team was ineffective. So how long the team lasts as a team how happy the team is to work with each other, and more clearly, how well the team performs on the uh, particular project or product or service provision are all three different ways of looking at team effectiveness. Well, let's move on. Here we have the aforementioned degrees of task interdependence. 
and they range on the leftmost vertical axis from low to medium to high. And we have some diagrams there with two-headed or one-headed arrows explaining the nature of the relationship between persons A, B, and C on a team. So at the very lowest level of interdependence, oops, let's start with the top, I'm sorry. At the very highest level of interdependence, we have reciprocal interdependence. This is where work output travels back and forth amongst employees. So for example, let's say you're a member of a team of book editors whose job it is to edit a manuscript that will hopefully be eventually published by your book publishing company. And so the team may pass the manuscript back and forth to each other, making reciprocal changes and changes built upon changes until finally the entire team is happy with the final edited manuscript there. So the reciprocal nature of interdependence suggests that exchange is two way. Person A passes it to B who can pass it right back to A, who can pass it to C, who can pass it right back to A or maybe to person B as we see in the ABC diagram at the top of this slide. The next level of interdependence is sequential. This is a medium level of interdependence. It's slightly lower than reciprocal. And here what we're saying is that the output of one employee becomes the starting point for the next employee. So person A passes their work product on to person B, who passes their work product on to person C. Well, what's the obvious example here? The assembly line. On an assembly line, a prototypical assembly line where a conveyor belt passes unfinished product from one person to another who are standing in stationary positions by the conveyor belt, this is a sequential level of task interdependence. Person C at the far end of the chain, their work performance is going to be almost entirely dependent upon persons A and B above them, ahead of them, at the front of the assembly line. So if person A passes sloppy product onto person B, person B cannot perform their job nearly as well. And if they then pass sloppy product on the assembly line down to person C, their job performance suffers as well. Next, we have pooled interdependence. This is the lowest level of interdependence. So this is when employees work interdependently while sharing perhaps a common resource. For example, think about electronic component manufacturing. Many times we'll set these people up at a U-shaped table or even a circular table and all the parts are in a giant bucket in the middle. And people pull their components and assemble them piece by piece working right next to each other but on their own product but they pull products from the same common resource here. So if one person is, let's say person A is particularly adept at assembling these electronic components, they can draw all the resources out because they've assembled so many finished products. And person B, their performance will suffer because person A has taken all the stuff out of the bucket. Person C will equally suffer because they can't keep up with person A either. So this level of interdependence is really related to the common resource there that they all share. There's not much interdependence except for that common bucket of parts, so to speak. Well, we can give an example here looking at the three major American sports. Look, this is not a perfect example, but it's one that comes to mind. Think of the three major sports. What are they? Football, basketball, baseball. Okay. Which of these three sports do you think has the pooled, uh, well, let's talk about the reciprocal. Which of them is most likely to have a reciprocal degree of interdependence? Here, let's think. Person A can pass the ball to person B, who can pass it back to A. Who can pass it to C, who can pass it to B or A. The roles change all the time. On what sport of those three major sports can you instantaneously change from offense to defense and back again instantaneously? Clearly, that's basketball. Now, we have only two remaining, football and baseball. Which of these sports requires the sequential 
interdependence technique. Here, person A passes the ball to person B, who then passes the ball to C. Well, let's think of the obvious example. Person A hikes the ball to person B, who then hands it off to person C. Well, clearly, that's football. Since we only have one other sport left, <laughs> we're going to have to designate that one as pooled. That's not a great resource, uh, a, a great example there, because what's the common resource? I'm not sure. Can person A win the game single-handedly? Yeah, there are one to nothing games, you know, where the winning team won the game because of a solo blast home run. Yeah. Uh, but baseball players also have to play defense, and so uh, it'd be pretty tough to uh, play both pitcher and catcher at the same time and have no fielders to back you up. Uh, if the rules would allow it, I guess you could throw a perfect game, a no-hitter where nobody hits uh, gets to uh, first base, and you're the only batter, and you hit a solo home run that wins the game. Um, I don't know. It's kind of a silly example, but of these three major sports, this is probably the least interdependent. And I think basketball is a very clear example of reciprocal. And football is a slightly clearer example of sequential than would be baseball. But let's move on. These are the stages of team development. And every team goes through these stages. Now, these stages may last for shorter or longer uh, time periods for different teams. And in fact, some teams will go through these stages of development again and again, depending upon the nature of the project, which they are assigned and reassigned and another project assigned to them. But the first stage of team development is the forming stage. This is where members learn about each other and evaluate their membership. Members are usually more polite at this stage, and uh, they're more likely to submit to leadership. Think, for example, of being picked for a, a, a playground kickball team. As soon as you're picked, you walk over and everybody kind of sizes each other up and says, all right, who's got good fielding skills? Who do we think can kick the heck out of this ball? We size each other up. We get to know each other and we say, well, how many of us have experience in kickball? How many of us are good at catching? You should play first base. How many of you are good at throwing? Well, you should play the outfield. Um, and we tend to then uh, um, be more willing to accept the guidance of one particular um, high-performing, potentially high-performing member of the team. Maybe there's a kickball coach who assigns the roles. Then we go into the storming stage. This is where interpersonal conflict tends to develop. Somebody says, well, I'm really good at catching the ball. I can play first base. And somebody else says, no, 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 no. I've seen you catch the ball. You're not very good at all, really. I'm much better at catching the ball than you. I should play first base. And then we have some interpersonal conflict arising there. Well, in stage three, and bearing in mind, of course, the dashed, single-headed arrow in this model says that we can fall back or revert back to any stage at any time. But the third stage in progression is the norming stage. This is where cohesion tends to develop strongest. We have shared objectives and common mental models that develop within our interactions and within our own minds. So here's where the team sets up the rules of behavior. Look, on this team, we don't accuse each other of being bad kickball players. We support each other every opportunity. We say, good job, good job, even if it wasn't such a good job. Those are the norms of our behavior on this team. In the workplace, the norming stage is where the concept of a rate buster can arise. And a rate buster is a term applied from labor unions where some labor union members tend to frown upon members of the workplace who perform at an exceptionally high rate of performance. They're working too well, working too hard, and when management sees that a superior job can indeed be done, other members of the workplace say, hey, 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 you over there, slow it down, you're making us look bad. Around here, we don't make each other look bad. So that's the norming stage. 
The fourth stage, and this is why people are put into teams in the first place, this is the most important stage. This is the performing stage. Here, the, the teams are ultimately able to coordinate and resolve their conflicts. This is where they get the job done. This is where they win the kickball game. This is where they make the major sale to a, a prospective client. This is where they ultimately designed a mass selling automobile this is the performing stage. And then last but not least on this is the adjourning stage. In this stage, the final stage, this is right before the team separates. Members tend to focus on their relationships instead of on the tasks here. And they make the decision of, wow, would I be willing to work with this person on another team again in the future? Some teams are very sad at this stage. They've really bonded well. They've worked well together, but now they have to go on to another project or become a member of a different team. This is common in professional sports when a team member is traded. Sometimes there is great sadness when a pro athlete is traded from one team or another, uh, one team to another. There's sadness on the part of the person who is traded, but also sadness by their teammates who say, oh my gosh, I really like that person. It's a shame they got traded. What am I going to do now? They were my best friend of the team. Now, in other teams who tend not to have such cohesiveness, the adjourning stage is something to which they look forward. So let's explore something about cohesiveness. Here we have some influences on team cohesiveness. That is, things that increase team cohesiveness, make it better, so to speak. And again, team, team cohesiveness is the degree of attraction that people feel toward the team and their motivation to remain members of the team. So there's really two kinds of cohesiveness here. We have calculative cohesiveness. Members believe that the team will fulfill goals and needs. And then we have an emotional cohesiveness. And this is where the team is simply a part of the person's social identity. Human beings are social animals. They have an innate need to have affiliative bonds with other social animals like themselves. People want to be together. They often have strong affective reactions to being a member of the team. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, they're often sad when they're no longer a member of the team there. So some of the things to think about here are member similarity. This is often referred to as homophily. That's H-O-M-O-P-H-I-L-Y. And this is the degree to which people prefer to be with others who are like themselves. Accountants tend to work well with other accountants. Marketing people tend to work well with other marketing people here. And so when we have members of a team who are fairly similar to each other, they tend to be more cohesive as a team than when they are dissimilar to each other. That should make intuitive sense. Next, we have team size. And we've previously discussed this as the size of the team gets so large, cohesiveness decreases. So this is an inverse relationship. Teams of four to six or so are probably appropriate for most tasks. But if you're on a team that has 120 people, like a college football team, there may be members of the team that you don't even know. How can you have a cohesive bond with people that you don't even know? People you may not even recognize very often. Next, we have member interaction and the degree of interaction, the quality of the interaction, the amount of the interaction builds cohesiveness. That's why This is why it's very important for virtual teams to have at least some face-to-face -face interaction and to avoid only asynchronous interaction via fax machine or two cans and a string or something like that. Next, we have... Difficult entry, when there is somewhat difficult entry to the team, the team tends to be very cohesive. Think, for example, about a prestigious MBA program. Once you're admitted, you look around and say, wow, I am so glad I'm here. This was hard to get into, and now I'm a part of something really important. Think about athlete, pro athletic teams. Making the team will 
enhance your cohesiveness with other team members. Think about a sorority or fraternity where there's a pledge ship, an entire semester of all sorts of difficulty that you're put through. Once the pledge ship is over, you feel like you're a very strong member of the team. Next, we have team success. When the team is successful, people want to be a part of the team. Think about the Houston Astros, the worst team in Major League Baseball right now. Do you think that people would prefer to be a member of the Astros or the Red Sox? Probably the Red Sox because they have a much better record. They're doing a lot better. The Red Sox team is probably very cohesive. The Astros team is probably right now looking, some of its members are looking to be traded. They want off that team because the team is no good. And then last we have external challenges. When teams face a so-called common enemy, they tend to be very cohesive. This is the circle the wagons mentality there when the Americans were pushing westward, westward in the uh, American territories and uh, they had to face the uh, Native Americans who didn't want their land stolen from them naturally enough. And when the American Indians would attack, the pioneers would circle their wagons literally and put the women and children in the middle and uh, the men would get their rifles out and start firing away uh, from the circle. So when we have an external challenge, we tend to have very strong bonds with people who are facing that external challenge. Well, let's move on. Let's discuss trust. Trust is a psychological state comprising the intention to accept vulnerability based upon positive expectations of the intent or the behavior of another person. It's a willingness to be vulnerable because we expect the other person to do the right thing. Well, as you might surmise, there are various levels of trust. Sometimes we don't trust very much at all. Sometimes we trust explicitly. It's not just implicit, it's explicit. We say to people, I trust you with my life. You've heard that before in, in movies, of, of course, and maybe in the real world, if you're a member of the military, etc. At the very lowest level of trust, oops, sorry, let's start at the top. <laughs> at the very highest level of trust, we have identification-based trust. This is based on a common mental model of how things should work. It's based on a common set of values, an emotional bond, a mutual understanding. In this level of trust, members think, act, and feel similar to each other. This increases with the person's social identity with the team. It's as if the members of the team say, we're the killers and the killers always win and I know everyone will do their part so we can keep winning and the killers have special t-shirts made up and on every Friday the killers wear their t-shirts to work we're the killers and guess what you're not so they have a very strong level of trust with each other they know that as a member of the killers they will do what is expected of them they have higher trust than the medium level, which is knowledge-based trust. This is based solely on the other party's predictability and competence. It's fairly robust, meaning it can accept some mild um, violations of it, and it tends to develop especially over time. So you might say, well, you know, Sue always receives high grades in her courses, so I know she'll do a good job on her part of this course. Knowledge-based means you know someone will do something well because they've done it in the past. This doesn't mean you have a strong, cohesive bond with them. You wear the same t-shirt to work on Fridays, but you trust them because you know they'll do the right thing. At the lowest level, we have something called calculus-based trust. This is the expected consistency of behavior based almost exclusively on simple deterrence. This is fragile and limited trust that is dependent upon punishment. The prominent example here is if you don't do this, you'll be fired. 
Well, do I trust that you'll do it? Yes, I have calculated that you will do it because you know that if you don't, I will fire you. So uh, this is the lowest level of trust here. And ideally, we would hope to rise up from the lowest level to the medium level, ultimately to the highest level of trust. And that will work really well for most teams in the workplace. Well, let's move on. In the previous lecture, we talked about individual types of decisions. Here, let's talk about some team-based decisions and some constraints on them. First is time. We need time to organize and time to coordinate when we are trying to make a decision on what to do as a team. Here we have the issue of production blocking. Sometimes we just don't have enough time to spit out all of our ideas. We must remember the idea and then find a good time to get in, get in a word edgewise, so to speak there. So if we are on a time crunch, we may not make the most effective decision because time limits our ability or constrains our ability to make effective decisions. You also have conformity to peer pressure. This is a serious issue here where we suppress our opinions that oppose team norms. This is a function of excess cohesiveness. Sometimes we will not offer a really potentially good idea as a member of a team because the norm may be that we don't speak up in opposition to each other's idea on this team. So conforming to the peer pressure that suppresses opinions actually constrains our ability to make good decisions as a team. Next, we have evaluation apprehension. And this is the belief that other team members are silently evaluating you. This is engendered by a need to maintain self-esteem and create a favorable self-presentation. This is the fear of being negatively evaluated by others. And it rears its head quite often in large classrooms where people will be reluctant to ask a question in the presence of all of their teammates for fear of being thought to be silly or stupid. Um, and this happens quite a bit. And usually they'll come down to the class at the end and they'll ask the professor, here's a question I have. And the professor's response is almost always, what a great question. I wish you would ask that in front of the whole class so we could have all learned from it. And the person inevitably says, well, I was embarrassed to ask it because I didn't want people to think I was stupid. That's evaluation apprehension. This is particularly problematic in a team-based scenario where team members evaluate each other later. If you later are part of the performance appraisal and you consistently offer up silly or stupid ideas, that can negatively affect your eventual performance appraisal by your teammates. So evaluation apprehension constrains our ability to make good decisions as teams. Next, we have group polarization. This is the tendency for teams to make much more extreme decisions than any individual would alone. This is akin to the so-called mob mentality. Think, for example, about a 14-year-old boy hanging out on the street corner. He's not as likely to get into trouble as would five teenage boys hanging out on the same street corner or 20 teenage boys hanging out on the street corner. 20 teenage boys hanging out on a street corner are likely to engage in all sorts of shenanigans. Why? Because they can diffuse the blame. That is, they can say, well, it wasn't my idea that we spray paint the principal's car. That was not my idea. Everybody spray painted the car. It wasn't just me. So they make a much riskier decision because they can diffuse or spread the blame for the eventual poor decision that they make. Now, we next have groupthink, which is a tendency to value consensus at the expense of decision quality. And we have a full slide on that. So let's move on. Here are some symptoms of groupthink. When teams are highly cohesive, excessively cohesive, they tend to make decisions 
which are very, very bad. When teams have a very strong identity with the group, when they're isolated from outsiders, they tend to make collectively bad decisions. When they face external threats, they engage often in groupthink. By now, it should be clear. Groupthink is bad. It's always bad. It's bad, bad, bad. When a team has a very opinionated leader to whom no one wishes to go against, the team tends to accept the leader's idea willy-nilly because the need for consensus for cohesiveness to not go against the grain tends to cause the team to engage in groupthink. When the team has recently faced some failures, groupthink will arise. And when the team lacks very clear guidance, groupthink will arise. Well, there's a classic example in business about the Edsel. The Edsel was a car that was uh, designed and manufactured by Ford Motor Company in I think 1957 and Edsel was the name of the son of the founder or the grandson of the founder of Ford Motor Company. First off, Edsel is kind of a strange name. Well, it was kind of a strange car. It was very advanced. It had push button uh, shifters on the steering wheel, which is not uncommon today, but in 1957, it was just weird. It violated the mental model that customers held on how to shift their car's transmission. It also was very, very ugly. And its grill was in the shape of what was called a horse collar. And this was a collar that was hung around horses, which made people think that this was kind of an antiquated throwback to the horse and buggy, which people really had tried to get away from for the past 50 years. And so its ugliness and its poor design led to very poor sales. Well, why is this group think? Because this was a car that was championed by the Ford family. How dare you go against a car design that is named after the son or grandson of the founder? That cannot happen. So the members of the design team and the manufacturing group just kowtowed. That is, they went along with everything that was decided. Eventually, a very ugly car was created. There are also multiple examples from just contemporary history. The Watergate burglary was an example of groupthink. The so-called um, Watergate, uh, the so-called uh, White House plumbers, which was a group of coverts who uh, decided to try and plug all of the leaks coming out of the White House, and that's how they got the name plumbers, decided it would be a great idea to break into the Democratic National Committee's headquarters before the election and find out what the opposition had planned. Well, that was not a good idea. So clearly we can see here that we have a relationship on this graph to the right between a need for consensus and decision quality. This is a curvilinear relationship. That is, as we follow the red curved line from the origin of the axis, as need for consensus improves, decision quality improves to a certain point. If the need for consensus, like on the far right of this inverted U, when the need for consensus is overwhelming and paramount such that no good alternatives are offered, then the decision quality is almost always very poor. That's groupthink. Let's move on. Okay, here are some team structures or rather team methods that help improve creativity and decision making in general. First, we have the concept of constructive conflict. This occurs when team members debate their different perceptions about an issue in a way that keeps the conflict focused on the task rather than the people. The problem here is that constructive conflict easily slides into personal attacks. So constructive conflict is something that we seek to have. We want conflict of this sort within our teams because ideally the two heads are better than one comes up with the leads to the two ideas resulting in one best idea. 
Next, we have brainstorming. There are several rules that we should follow when engaging in brainstorming as a team-based method for making decisions or coming up with creative solutions to a problem. Everybody in the team should be allowed to speak completely freely. No criticism of anyone's ideas should be offered at all, ever. The idea behind this is that each member should provide as many ideas as possible. And in fact, sometimes one person's ideas build upon the other person's ideas. So, for example, in a brainstorming session, one team member might offer a completely cockamamie solution. And the other members cannot stop and say, that's just stupid. Don't just just be quiet. No, the idea is that even if I offer a really weird or potentially invalid solution, it may spur a thought in another team member's mind. That is, their idea that they offer could build upon ours. There are two major problems with brainstorming. One is evaluation apprehension, which we've already explained. And the other is production blocking, which we've mentioned very fleetingly. This is problematic in brainstorming where everyone could potentially be talking at the same same time. Here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea, and everybody's saying that all at the same time. Sometimes we may wait until there's a lull in the idea offering to make our own idea, and our ideas can be blocked from being produced there. Sometimes we forget what it was we were going to say if we're waiting for someone to be quiet so we can offer an idea. So we've moved to a form of brainstorming called electronic brainstorming. With this, the participants share their ideas not verbally, but rather using software. So this is usually done in the same room, but of course, the teammates could be in different areas of the building or even the world for that matter. And it requires some fairly sophisticated uh, software. Basically, you type into the software all of your ideas there. You type into your own computer terminal there. The question is posed, and then the participants submit their ideas or their comments um, as frequently and in as much volume as they wish. The ideas are then posted on a common screen in a random fashion. No one knows whose idea is associated with who, with whom. That is, the ideas are just posted in a random fashion. And while there may be some snickering about some silly ideas, um, no one's idea can be tied to them. Then, after all of the ideas have come up on the computer screen, then they're evaluated as regarding their uh, potential problem solution ability. Now, next we have something called the nominal group technique. And this is a technique that's a, uh, a, a decision-making technique in, in groups only, uh, in name only, or rather for groups. And it's a variation of brainstorming, and there are several steps that we should follow there. First, we describe the problem. The problem is, say, our automobile sales in the compact auto market are declining rapidly or anything, okay? Then individuals silently write down as many solutions as they can. Ideally, each solution should be on a different piece of paper. And so maybe you use index cards, note cards, and you write down a different solution to this problem and you write down just as many as you can without any talking. Then the third step, the individuals describe their solutions to the group in a round robin fashion. So person one offers their solution, their first solution. Then person two offers their first solution. Then person three offers their first solution. Then you go back to person one who offers their second solution. Person two offers their second solution, etc., etc. There's no criticism or debate of the solutions at this time. So like brainstorming, we don't critique the solutions and we don't debate the validity of the solution at all. The only conversation is regarding a clarification of the issue. So maybe somebody says, well, we can um, increase our compact automobile sales by, and then they offer some technical mumbo jumbo that no one else understands. And so when offering these solutions orally, the other members of the team say, eh, I'm not sure what that means. Please explain it to us. They don't critique the solution. 
They don't debate it. They just ask for clarification. And then in the last step of the nominal group technique, the individuals rank order or vote on each proposed solution. So if you're rank ordering them and there are five people in the team and each person comes up with three solutions, you rank them from one to 15. Everybody ranks them and the person, the idea with the, the highest ranking solution uh, ultimately may be implemented. Next we have the Delphi method. And this is borrowed from Greek mythology. The oracle at Delphi was the a uh, mythical creature to whom you went for sage advice on a variety of issues. And it involves the pooling the collective knowledge of various experts who do not meet face to face. And so it makes great use of what's called a central convener. And the central convener is a person that offers up the problem to experts, usually highly paid experts, so their time is valuable. This can be expensive. Uh, offers up the uh, the problem to uh, experts around the, the company or around the world and says, here's a problem we have. What do you think we should do? What are some of your ideas? The experts then in their own due time come up with some solutions to the problem, send them back to the central convener who then distills them. Some of the experts may have come up with similar or common solutions. And so the central convener distills these solutions, throws out ones which are just really uh, ridiculous, uh, finds a common theme amongst others, um, and then says, okay, to another group of experts, here are some solutions that one group of experts has offered to this problem. How can you add on to or fix their solutions or make them better? What are some of your ideas? Those people then, in their own due time, send back their information, their advice to the central convener, who synthesizes the solutions again and sends them back to maybe the same members or maybe to another group of experts until ultimately the best idea is kind of synthesized upon the ideas of other experts who have come into the decision-making process at different stages. So this is very time-consuming and it's very expensive because the experts are presumably highly paid and their time is worth money. The last team structure or team method to improve creativity and decision-making that we'll talk about here is the devil's advocate approach. This comes from Roman Catholicism and is the name applied to a person who's appointed by the Pope to present countervailing arguments against sainthood for a person. When a person's nominated for sainthood, the Pope essentially assigns somebody to be the devil's advocate, to dig up dirt, so to speak, on why person X should not be a saint. So in various teams, the devil's advocate job is to punch holes in the ideas offered by others, and then explain why the idea will not work. This is not always a very pleasant task for some people, but it does help uncover oversights and eventualities and shortcomings of the ideas offered by other members of the teams. Ultimately, the idea is to have a more creative, better solution, better decision to the problem and the devil's advocate approach can be used quite uh, cost and time effectively. Guess what? That's all I have for you here.